Well, hi everyone and welcome to week one of the summer course for summer two, 2020. Uh, Professor Rios, I hope you've had a chance to watch the uh, welcome video. Uh, that was more administration, you know, where to go uh, for stuff. Uh, this is the actual first content video for the term. Uh, each week of the summer term, just like the regular fall or spring, not only would I, will I go over the uh, lesson slides that I would typically show during an actual in-person class, but I will also take, in, take advantage of Google Earth, which by the way, you can get for free using Chrome and only Google Chrome. So highly recommend it, very useful program, uh, and it's free. So there's no need to get an account or you know, any of that stuff. So having said that, uh, don't forget to uh, reference to the learning management system. Uh, in this case, that would be Blackboard. Make sure you understand what all the due dates are. So for week one of the summer course, it is roughly the equivalent of three weeks during the regular term. So it does go quickly. So please bear that in mind. Um, you know, summer courses can be very challenging from a time management perspective. So I just want you to make sure that you do um, give it its due uh, attention. So we'll begin with basically chapter one. So in the way the book is broken down is chapter one is all about sort of like the basics of geography, some of the basic terminology. Uh, chapter two is the physical geography and the environment. After that, every single region, so starting with North America, chapter three, addresses each region by looking at the human and the natural. So in this case, this would be more of the human, this would be more the natural. So obviously every region is different and every region has to be looked at differently. Uh, but you know, Every region has an environmental challenge. Every region has a geopolitical challenge. Every region has a population challenge. Um, so the reason that we go over chapters one and two first, as the book has it broken down, is so that then you can view all the regions in the context of these two basic overarching ideas. So that's the basic premise of how your book is set up. Okay, so let's get started with chapter one. Again, the welcome. You'll see here's an image of Dubai uh, at the beginning, you know, and it's a summer 2 2020 Pace online campus. Uh, this is part of the Dyson School of Arts and Sciences, okay? Now, this is what the book looks like. It is Globalization and Diversity, Geography of a Changing World, sixth edition. Of course, you are taking advantage of the ebook and the My Lab and Mastering for the homeworks and the quizzes are handled through Blackboard uh, electronically. Again, all homework is managed through that Mastering Geography, which you access through Blackboard. It is not timed but it does have a due date. And that's usually, I believe, Thursday night by midnight. Weekly chapters are taken on Blackboard and these are indeed timed events. So whenever you start a quiz on Blackboard, there's a clock running. So you have to be cognizant of that, okay? Now, some of the learning objectives. The big issue here is globalization. And in the wake of COVID-19 and in the wake of so many developments like the uh, crash of the oil and gas industry uh, and all kinds of other issues, globalization is it. We are in a globalized world. COVID-19, which started in China and spread throughout the world, is a globalized event, period. End of story, can't be debated. Uh, everything you do, whether you use an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy or a Google phone, uh, whether you wear an Adidas pair of sneakers or Nike, 
uh, whether you use a Microsoft tablet or an iPad, whether you have a Sony Bio or a JVC uh, stereo component, whether you drive a Honda or a Mercedes or a Ford or whatever the case might be, you take part in the globalized world, period. Now, globalization can be good, it can be bad, and some people view it somewhere in the middle. So we're not getting away from it. Climate change is a globalized event. Uh, COVID-19, as I mentioned, was a globalized event. Um, the economic status of the world right now, whether that be good, bad, whether it's gonna get better or worse, uh, the upcoming election in November and all its ramifications, whether President Trump gets reelected or Biden gets elected, whatever the case might be, has globalized ramifications, period. So it's a really interesting, complicated, complex, I mean, all this COVID-19 stuff has basically made people think about, maybe we should be a little bit more self-reliant. The president has said that, other people have said that, uh, that are not necessarily fans of the president. So it's something that's out there being thought of in the context of how weird the world got in a very quick hurry, okay? We'll look at that. These are some of the key concepts. You know, first defining what geography is, and it is both a natural and social science. That is what makes geography interesting. That is what makes geography unique. Uh, it really talks about the interrelationships of people and natural events and spheres, as it were. Uh, again, places matter. Uh, this is something my boss at West Point, when I used to teach there, told me one of the first things, you know, places matter. Why you do what you do, where you do it. Why you buy a house, where you buy it. Why you decide to move away from a, from a place or, or move towards a place has a geographical component to it that matters to you. That could be economics, that could be uh, better climate, that could be better opportunity. Uh, it could be a whole bunch of reasons. So places matter to people in the decisions that people make every day. Uh, and so typically and generally there's a financial component to it, okay? This is how your book is broken down. all the different regions. And again, you may agree and disagree with some of them, for example. You may think of Mexico and Central America as its own region. Well, the book doesn't. The book lumps it all into Latin America. Whereas the Caribbean, you could think of it as Latin American as well, but the book doesn't. So it really depends on your point of view, quite frankly. Again, globalization is the interconnectedness of things, both the physical and the human. And again, if you think about the idea of COVID-19, which began in Wuhan area of China, uh, eventually the United States basically barred the Chinese from flying into the United States. Uh, Europe barred Chinese from flying into Europe. We barred Europeans from flying into the US. It had a remarkable sort of domino effect on people. The idea of global culture, the hybridization of things, the promotion of Western values, even outside of the Western world. And by that I mean the US, Canada, Europe, and what are some of the images of globalization throughout the world, okay? Again, some of the advocates, these are the pro, the critics, and the people who hold a middle position. And you feel free to have your very own opinion, whether that be pro, critical of it, or somewhere in the middle. I am personally of the opinion, we can't get away from it, you can't just undo globalization, can't happen. 
uh, we are too sort of intertwined, but maybe you can change aspects of it. Again, it's a very interesting point of discussion um, that frankly might be a good discussion to have, uh, not just in this class, but really in many other aspects of academia and education and politics and all kinds of things. Okay, so here's the idea of you know, globalization, lithium mining, which takes place in the, what we call the Atacama region of South America, that would be Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and why is that important? Well, guess what? This is in your laptops, your cell phones. Uh, and so this, if you're uh, Apple or Samsung or any maker of a laptop out there, this is significant to you because this is where your resources are coming from in order for you to build your fancy schmancy computer, okay? The idea of, uh, in this case, is the illicit drug trade. So this would be informal globalization, you know, where there is a demand, a supply will rise up to meet it. This gives you a sense of some of the uh, movement of basically illegal drugs across the earth. Some of the regions that we can talk about, we can talk about formal regions functional regions and vernacular regions. So a, you know, when you look at something like the California, Mexico border, and this is where many of our fruits and vegetables and citrus are grown. Okay, this is basically taking advantage of the harnessing of water from the Colorado River in order to basically turn a desert, which would be this, into a very, very productive land. And not just in the US, but Mexico as well. Okay. Uh, let's look at the idea of connections. And this is Facebook as of 2020 in February. About 31% of all humans use Facebook. I'm thankfully not one of those 31%. But 2.4 billion users are. And so this is kind of a big deal because this is a connectivity issue that as recently as 2007 didn't exist. And you as an 18, 19, 20 year old may not know a world without Facebook. Yet the world got along just fine without it before it happened. But once it happened, then it became a sort of normality and the thing to do. And now you can think of things like TikTok and Instagram and uh, WhatsApp and Reddit. And gosh, I can even keep up with some of this crap that's out there. Um, as you can see, I'm not really a social media fan. Uh, you can probably figure that out by now. But you know, this is a big deal. It's a big deal to a lot of people. I mean, it's great for some things. It's awful for other things but it isn't going away. That's the point I'm trying to make. That connection and that sense of connectivity is becoming a far more far-flung thing across the earth every day. Cultural landscape. This is an interesting and very simple meaning and definition that you should know. It is simply the visible imprint that people leave behind. So that image there is rice paddy agriculture in the Philippines. The terrain is not flat, but they still have to grow crops. So they've created these terraces that they use to grow rice. Well, that is a non-natural environment that the people there have adapted to meet their needs, okay? Or you think of a place like Dubai and how much it has changed in such a period, just a short period of time, to it having the tallest structure on earth, 2,700 feet. Remember, that's 1,000 feet taller than the World Trade Center in New York City. So that gives you a sense of, you know, sort of, this is a bit of geopolitical muscle flexing that went on. 
or cultural landscapes like a religious landscape. This is the Bora Badur um, religious uh, landscape in Indonesia and religion is one of the most significant, I use the word indelible. If you don't know what it means, look it up. It is one of the most indelible things about culture on earth, religion. Even if you are not a particularly religious individual, whether you be a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Zoroastrian, whether you be a Buddhist, uh, whether you would be a Hindu, well, it doesn't really matter what your religion and your background is. Religion, like if you go to Israel, Judaism is the most important and significant aspect to Jews throughout Israel in that part of the world. But guess what? Not that far from there, you have mosques that are just as important to Muslims in the same region. So religion is a really, really strong measure of culture and cultural landscapes throughout the world. I'm going to look at population. Population is significant because in my opinion, population is probably one of the most significant things about humanity. It drives many, many things across the earth, from how governments deal with their populations, to economic vigor, to the future. Okay, so we'll look at that. We're going to look at uh, statistics, ugh, statistics and data, things like Total fertility rate, that's one of the ones I'm going to focus primarily on. Total fertility rate is basically the number of children born to a woman during her reproductive years. Okay, and the lower that number is, the more developed a country is. It is just one of those things. So countries with the highest fertility rates have some of the least amount or the, the least expressions of development. It's just the way that is. And so we'll look at things like population pyramids. We'll look at things like, you know, as a half male, half female, and it gives you five year increments showing you whether you have rapid growth, slow growth, or negative growth. We're gonna look at things like demographic transition, so in this case, the population graph is the red, the birth rate is the blue, and the death rate is the purple. So basically, stage two countries have a huge difference between birth rate and death rate, so their populations grow fast. Stage three countries, that death rate and birth rate become closer together, so they still grow, but they are slowing down an example nearby would be mexico would fit stage three stage four would be the u.s a country that is has a lower birth rate and a low death rate so therefore it is considered industrial and it is considered a stage four country and a stage five country is a place like japan for example, where in some cases, the birth rate actually is less than the death rate. So therefore, the population is shrinking over time. Now, a high death rate doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just simply means the country is old. And Japan is one of the oldest countries in the world in terms of its population makeup. And we, by the way, the United States, we're headed right there with them. In the next 20 to 40 years, the U.S. is going to get ex very, very old. And because your generation, young people, are not having as many kids, there's going to be an imbalance between elderly and young. That's one of those things, again. Uh, we're going to look at migration, whether that be voluntary force. What are the things that push you away from a location? What are the things that pull you towards a location? Okay, uh, from the slave trade, the African trade slave, which basically stems from equatorial and Western Africa towards play, mostly South America, basically Brazil had the majority of the slave trade go to it, uh, to the Caribbean, Central America, and of course, the United States. 
and as a result, you know, or, or for example, the movement of Native Americans out of their primary region, like the Seminole and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw and the Cherokee, and why you find a place like Oklahoma, where the Seminole are not from Oklahoma, the Seminole are from Florida, but they were moved there, and this is the Trail of Tears. This is forcibly being removed from their homeland to Oklahoma, basically. The reason, by the way, Oklahoma has the highest percentage of Native American heritage of any state in the United States. When we look at some of the ideas of, you know, rural versus urban, when we look at urban structure and how different cities are differently oriented and differently set up across many regions. For example, we'll, we'll talk about these. These are called uh, in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, they're called favelas. And notice they are basically hodgepodge. These are unimproved housing developments. We'll look about the idea of hybridization, for example, a place like cricket, not a place, a sport like cricket, which has been adopted by Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. Why? Because of the colonial influence of the British, just like baseball in Japan, in Taiwan, and Korea. We'll look at the idea of culture and what culture actually is. We'll look at language and how language is spread across Earth space. Religion, of course, that's probably the most, frankly, one of the most interesting aspects of culture in the world. And this map is a really, really good map, actually, which shows you percentages of a particular religion, whether it be Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or Christianity, whether that be Catholicism, or Protestantism, you can definitely see the changes as you go from one area of the world to the other. Look up the idea of the colonial imprint. And when you look at a place like Africa, the continent of Africa, you can see the influence of so many places. And you still see that lingered to this day. Um, recent conflict, even though this has somewhat abated, the idea of ISIS and the civil war that took place in Syria starting back in 2011, which led to so many refugee movements out of Syria into Turkey. We'll look at some economic and social development statistics like the Human Development Index, which is basically a number between zero and one. The higher the number, the more developed you are. So look at a place like the U.S. at a 0.92. The highest you could possibly be is 1.0. So the U.S. is pretty high. But you have a country like, let's say, Nigeria at 0.52. And so a whole bunch of factors go into creating these social and economic indicators. Like, for example, gender inequality, uh, mortality, education, uh, those kinds of factors. Look at economic development, you know, about social development, health, and education. Ending with, you know, you can look at one like literacy and education of women. And, you know, the, the more equitable education is between men and women, meaning 50-50, the more developed the country is. So there are some really interesting developmental factors. Education, role of women in society, and fertility. It's, it's just universal. So in places that are really, really, really highly developed, women make up a significant percentage of the workforce, women have fewer children, and women are educated. Where that's not the case, Central and Sub-Saharan Africa, Afghanistan, you have basically a bigger gap between men and women 
in terms of overall development. All right, so that's the first presentation. Now, my recommendation as you do this is maybe you can watch it a bit at a time. You don't have to watch the whole thing at once. You can if you want, but you can stop it, focus on chapter one, do the reading, look at the ebook, practice, you know, all that stuff. So manage it as it works best for you. All right, so that was chapter one. Chapter two is, on the other hand, more about the physical geography and the environment. So, of course, we're going to be dealing in more natural events. But, of course, all these natural events affect people. So, let's look at some of these, the idea of geology, climate, and understanding how the physical context, the physical environment, affects human interactions with the world around it, right? So these are some of the concepts. And the human imprint is impossible to ignore. And systems are connected. So look at this image here. I know, kind of gross, right? This is a dead seagull. But what's in it? By now, you've hopefully seen all the plastic inside that poor animal. This animal didn't know that that blue cap was uh, plastic. All it knew is that it was floating, so it ate it. Of course, at some point, it forced the animal to die because the animal could process that plastic. And therefore, it gives you a sense of when you throw something out, out of the window of your car, God, I hope you don't do that. But if you do, please note that that junk is going to find its way somewhere. Oftentimes a river, which all empty into either lakes or the ocean. Once in the ocean, it's there for maybe not ever, but it's there for a really, 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 really long time, okay? Uh, we'll look at some of the geological environmental concerns, the idea of plate tectonics. So depending on where you are, you have different scenarios. Like, for example, you can have places where plates are colliding, creating deep ocean trenches, and also creating tall mountains and volcanoes. Or island arcs. And you have these big plates across Earth. And depending on where you are, you are under constant threat of volcanic and earthquake activity, like around the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire. So places like the Philippines, Japan, Russia, the Aleutian chain of Alaska, and the Northwest. You have the entire western coast of South America and Central America. Uh, it is a very, very well-known area of tectonic activity in, and it manifests itself in earthquake and volcanic activity. Here's, for example, San Andrea. In this case, you have two plates sliding past one another. Uh, and of course, the geologic hazards, either a little earthquake, that would be a little circular yellow circle, or a little red triangle to signify the volcano in that particular region. So these are natural hazards that human populations have to deal with, okay? Again, whether it be volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991, which by the way cooled the earth by about half a degree for about one year, or something as recent as the January 2010 Haiti earthquake, which unfortunately destroyed many areas with very poor construction code. Global climates, and this is not climate change here, just global climates, and how climates are controlled by where you are. Are you close to land or are you in the middle, I'm sorry, are you close to water or are you in the middle of a continent? Uh, latitude and longitude matter and how much energy you get. So if you're near the equator, you're gonna have energy all the time. You're gonna have a surplus of energy. Days are always gonna be 12 hours long. Whereas if you live in a higher latitude, uh, 
your summer days are going to be longer, but your winter days are going to be really short in terms of day length. So that matters. The greenhouse effect. And if you remember anything, the greenhouse effect is not, I repeat, not climate change. The greenhouse effect is a natural event. It is the reason we have a planet that is livable. It is the blanket of water vapor and carbon dioxide that make the Earth be able to trap some of its own infrared energy, making the Earth a livable system. Otherwise, otherwise the Earth would be a really, really cold ball of ice. Uh, the influence of latitude, of course. You know, we think about uh, Hurricane Sandy that affected New York and New Jersey and Connecticut in 2012. This hurricane began way, way, way south in the Caribbean. And again, these are the different kinds of winds and pressure patterns that you find across the Earth, whether they be, um, you know, um, again, in the Western world here, or the uh, African, centered on Africa, centered on the US, you have different trade winds or westerly winds, and there's a certain symmetry. This right here is called a conceptual model, meaning it's not necessarily mathematical, but it's more visual to give you a sense of what you should typically expect. different climate regions and climates. This is called the Köppen climate classification and it is basically, uh, it is a climate system divided into six different letters, A, B, C, D, and E, with an H climate called Highland climate. Very simple. It is a system based on data, so it's empirical. But it gives you a sense of, oh, if, you, or if you're in a certain type of climate, you should expect a certain kind of weather, depending on the time of year that that is. So for example, uh, savanna climates that tend to be tropical, wet, and dry. So in that case, you have a seasonality to your climate, okay? Climate change, of course, is something that we have to address. Uh, so the idea of anthropogenic, and that word you should know, not just in this course, but really you should know the word, period. Anthropogenic is human-caused. Anything with anthro implies human. So the big gases are, of course, water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas. The most significant to climate change is carbon dioxide. Then you have methane, nitrous oxygen, I'm sorry, nitrous nitrogen oxides, methane, chlorofluorocarbons, and all these can be affected by humans with the exception of water vapor. Water vapor is fixed, we don't control that. There's a fixed amount of water in the world. But carbon dioxide and methane, we do affect. And again, China is now the biggest producer of carbon dioxide in the world. It used to be the US. Uh, China is a very, very fast-growing economy. Uh, they're doing a lot of things to fix that. They are definitely going big time into solar and renewables, but they're also a 1.4 billion person country. So it's harder to do. Again, re energy, renewable versus non-renewable. The idea of renewable energy, we're talking about, you know, how countries across the world are basically striving to significantly up the amount of renewable energy that accounts for their electric generation. How can climates be reconstructed? Well, these are called climate proxies or approximations. So from something as simple as tree rings, which can only give you so much data, obviously, to things like mud, sand, mud cores and ice cores, which can reconstruct the climate going back millennia. Water, of course, you know, there's a lot of water on Earth, yet 
very little of it is fresh water. So that little bit of fresh water has to account for 7.4 billion people on Earth. And this right here shows you areas of the Earth predicted to be water stressed by the year 2025. And that would be in that darker orange color. A lot of areas of the world. The idea of pollution and water sanitation. Access to water can be a big deal. You, you take it for granted. You just go to your bathroom, you open the tap, you brush your teeth and the water's just running, 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 or you're watering your plants, your grass four times a day. You don't even think about it. Water is readily available. In many parts of the world, it's a daily thing that you have to plan for. And so that's kind of a big deal. Bioregions, different areas of the world, these are called bioclimatic regions, meaning the climate drives the kinds of plants and the kinds of ecosystems that are possible within those regions. Okay, so we'll be in the tropical rainforests. And that implies the idea of deforestation. This is going to be a big recurring theme throughout the regions and what are the effects of deforestation what are the cultural effects what are the economic effects and what are the environmental effects of tropical rainforest deforestation and deforestation period okay would it be a tropical one or a temperate forest again in the amazon deforestation is primarily for cattle ranching the Angus beef industry. But if you go to a place like Indonesia, it's for palm oil, which is, by the way, in most everything you either use or eat. So if you eat Burger King food or Domino's or Pizza Hut, or if you like ramen noodles, or if you like milk chocolate, or if you wear lipstick or eyeshadow, it is in a lot of products, and we'll go over that later in the semester. The idea of decertification in marginal lands like Africa Sahel region, which is basically a region we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, or Bangladesh in South Asia. Probably one of the biggest natural disasters and human disasters coming because it is an area about four times the population of California that is very, very close to sea level. So it's very vulnerable to hurricanes and migration that's forced as a result of where they sit in the world. Here's the Sahel region. This is what, where, where it sits. It's that blue line. So it's an area that's not quite desert, but it isn't quite tropical rainforest. And as a result, the agriculture in the region is very dependent on um, seasonal rains, which may or may not come. Notice how the precipitation switches north in September, and with it, so does the agriculture and the greenery of the region. So agriculture is completely tied to this. And there are environmental stressors in the area that are tied to climate variability and change. And humans have a big role to play in that. This region of the world, by the way, the Sahel region of Africa, is a region that is forecast to double in population over the next 40 years one of the few regions that is still growing very fast. You know, it's supposed to double to about 200 million by 2050. So there's, there's physical issues to consider, and there are cultural issues to consider, like a very, very young population, okay? But the Green Revolution and agricultural techniques and the use of fertilizers and pesticides 
and how that's led to, of course, environmental problems, but also increased productivity in food production. Okay, so we'll talk about that. And that is lesson two, okay? Now, you can take another break, stop it if you want. Whatever is most significant for you. So now, now we're going into the first region. So I want to basically go into, so that'll be North America. But before we get into that, I do want to show you um, Google Earth. So let's maximize that. And you know, Google Earth is this great program. Here you see it, you can control the globe. And we're gonna be focusing on North America. North America in your book is basically United States and Canada. So here we go, it's a very large region. Even when the United States, let's focus on that first. I mean, it's very different here in the Northeast as you get to the Midwest, the, the, the prairie and the western part of the US. It's very different climatically, it's very different culturally, it's very different politically, it's very different really in almost any way you can think of, right? So, you know, you have to think about the fact that if you've never taken a trip across the US, there's a great degree of variability across this big country that is the US. Like even within the state of Texas, the eastern half is very wet. The middle part is wet, dry, and then the western half is very deserted like. Uh, or the west coast, where the majority of the people live in cities like Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA, San Diego. But yet the middle, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, there's a whole lot of empty in this region with isolated big cities. Of course, in the US, you have the prairie. This is the big bread basket, one of the biggest in the world. We basically feed a lot of people with excess food from the middle of the US. In addition, it's an area that gets a lot of significant weather as a function of hot, warm air coming in from the Gulf cold, dry air coming down from Canada and sustaining agriculture throughout this whole region, okay? Um, one of the great things about Google Earth is the coloring gives you a sense of the type of biome you have, whether you have a temperate forest here in the southeast and north to grasslands in the western part of these states, to deserts in Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, and California. And then, of course, if you head north into Canada, you have in Canada and Alaska, you have pine forests, okay? Both Canada and the U.S. have been glacially carved through large stretches of it. Notice how many lakes you find in Canada from these big, great lakes in the US and Canada to smaller yet significant lakes throughout. I mean, you can zoom in and see this whole area is just simply dotted with water. And there are other big lakes uh, in the region, not just the Great Lakes, but lakes throughout. Uh, there's, they're called the, the Great Lakes of Canada. Here's one, here's two, three, four. So it's sort of, the, these lakes were basically left behind as the continental ice sheets melted roughly 20 to about 10,000 years ago when glaciation ended, leaving behind a lot of flat land, but also water, okay? So that's sort of the Google, Google Earth allows you to look at different areas in a lot of detail, you can look at, for example, the um, continental shelf of the coast. So for example, off the coast of New York and New Jersey, the ocean is really rather shallow. And you have to go kind of far out before you get into this very deep abyssal plain. It's like a big, it's a big cliff uh, where you go from continental shelf 
to ocean shelf down here, okay? And you can see Florida. Florida is basically surrounded by shallow ocean. The, the, the good thing about Florida is during cold climates, Florida is a much bigger state. And during warm climates, Florida disappears altogether. So Florida being very flat, has a history of not existing during really warm periods, meaning Florida is underwater. And if you go into places like Orlando and Jacksonville and right in the middle of Florida and you dig, you find seashells. What does that tell you? It tells you that the ocean used to be there at some point. So, you know, one of the interesting things about Google Earth, it allows you to see this. Of course, you have Canada and Alaska, Alaska bordering Russia. Uh, a member of this at one point used to be a land bridge connecting what's now Siberia with Alaska. And that allowed human populations to be able to migrate from Asia to present day North America. So that, you know, I'll leave it at that with the Google overview this week it's you know more common north america and canada north america is canada and the u.s it's the first region that we're going to look at so having said that i want to go back to minimizing that a bit and going back to the lesson in this case in north america you know i chose new york as the image at the beginning well you know it's i could have chosen a whole bunch of different Places. But let's go with New York. And this is why North America flourished. If this were a class being offered in a European university, guess what? You begin with Europe. That would make sense, right? Some of the key concepts again, the boundaries. It's a highly mobile, highly industrialized and urbanized region. Uh, I need to update this to go economic strength despite the 8, 10 recession and let's just say it, the 2020 recession um, because we're in the middle of one of those right now. So still economic strength despite all that. This is the, again, I just show you that on, on on Google Earth, it's just a better way. I highly recommend you down, you, not, you don't have to download that you use Google Earth on Chrome. Great, great way of looking at the planet and learning a lot about geography, quite frankly, frankly. You know, modifying the environment, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Uh, this was a place chosen by the French. It used to be an entry point into the, what's, what used to be the French holdings in North America. And it connected New Orleans to Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Of course, because it is mostly below sea level in many parts, when levees broke as a function of the storm strength, many parts of New Orleans flooded. There are other environmental issues in the US and Canada, from the oil sands of Alberta, Canada, to wildfires in California, Arizona. Uh, there has been some dramatic historic fires in California in 2017, in 2018, in 2019. I suspect there will be some in 2020, later in the year when the season really kicks up as summer dries up the land. Uh, of course, acid rainfall has been an issue throughout history since the Industrial Revolution, but again, something that needs to be considered. And of course, the Ogallala Aquifer sits right here in Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. And this is a big water sponge underground that many farmers rely on. The problem is this aquifer is being used at a rate that's faster than nature replenishes it. So that's a problem. Again, whether it be um, California and its bouts with drought, 
it has since 2017 dried up and filled up two more times. So that gives you a sense of how vulnerable this area is. Hoover Dam, this is where this is where this was set up. This became this. Without this dam, the city of Las Vegas doesn't exist. That's how much water has been lost. The idea of human environmental interactions, again, modifying the environment. So of course, pollution, this is the city of Los Angeles. Now LA is a lot better at pollution than it used to be. Beijing in China is what LA used to be back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, so the air in Los Angeles is frankly a lot cleaner than it used to be. And that is because of a lot of legislation to mandate things like catalytic converters in cars and other environmental rules that have since been adopted by other places. This is oil, the oil spill. This is a beach in the Gulf. This is after the BP oil incident in 2010 that dumped so much oil into the Gulf of Mexico. And oil is a natural thing. Oil exists naturally, but when you harvest it, when you have a problem, that happens. And this is the delta of the Mississippi River Delta. And this is where the spill took place. Again, a, a, a diverse physical setting across the region, a diverse climatic setting across the region from boreal forests in Alaska and Canada, and a boreal forest is a pine needle forest, to high tundra in places like North Alaska, North Canada, to prairies and deserts and forests, they're found throughout North America. So you can fly east to west and fly through three or four or five different bioregions along the same latitude. And a lot of that has to do with proximity or distance away from the ocean and latitude. Again, these are the climates of the United States and Canada. Again, notice the US and Canada, mostly C and D climates. But as you head to the West, B climates are the only ones that are basically considered, the only ones that are derived strictly as a function of precipitation. All the other ones are a function of temperature. So A climates, C climates, D climates, and E climates are all temperature based. A, B climates are primarily precipitation based. Okay. What about climate change? It's a very political hot potato. It is right now. It will be in the future. It's been political since before Trump. It'll be political after Trump. So it, it's not a now thing. It may seem like a now issue, but it's not. It's been an issue since the 80s when it came into the general lingo. Okay. You know, and again, why does the loss of ice matter? And the quickest response is sea level rise but also water in the form of ice is a big contributor towards um, water resources. So if the ice is gone, then people who depend on melt water from ice for their daily water intake lose that. And that's a big problem. And that's a big problem in very populated areas like India, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, because a lot of the rivers that flow through those places, like the Ganges and the Yellow and the Yangtze and the Brahmaputra and the Indus rivers, all get their water from the Himalayan mountains. 
here's a, a change in ecosystem. This is Muir Glacier in Alaska and how much ice has been lost in basically a couple of generations. It looks like a completely different environment. The consumption of energy, of course, wood and coal and petroleum have been the biggest, but those will, and, and this is already a dated graphic. I haven't been able to find one that goes through at least 2015 or 2020, ideally, even though the year's not over. Uh, but obviously hydro, geo, and other wind and natural or renewable energy sources will begin to take off and become a bigger slice of this graphic. Population, of course, how it's distributed across the US. It's uneven. The majority of the population of the US, it's either on the immediate West Coast or basically from the Mississippi River East. Patterns of settlement in the US, of course, there are many stages from Western European stages to Eastern European to American, uh, Central and South American and Latin American to Asian. And again, some of the population indicators, the rate of fertility in the US and Canada, these rates are actually lower than even what you see here, 1.6 and 1.8. Um, the only reason the U.S. still grows in population is because of legal migration. Legal migration still forces an increase in population in the U.S. And this is the idea of migration. This is the U.S. 96, the U.S. in 2016, and the U.S. in 2050. The same thing with Canada in 1996. 2016 and 2050. Let's see, we're going to focus into the idea of urban settlement, you know, and how urban regions change. This is Times Square in 1985. I remember this. It was a dirty, grungy, filthy place. Now, Times Square is nothing but, you know, jumbotrons and videos and, um, you know, Hello Kitty stores and uh, Lego stores and the ESPN Sports Zone and all kinds of very pretty touristy things. That is not the Times Square of the not so distant past. So, you know, even within cities, change, things are always changing. New York City is as good an example as there is of that. Uh, the idea of cultural coherence and diversity. Uh, this is the percentage of white, Hispanic, Black, American, Indian, Asian, Pacific. And it goes from, you know, what the percentages are in 2010 or were to 2030 to 2050. Okay. So the fastest growing percentage of population is Hispanic in the United States. Not African American, not white not Asian, but Latinos is the fastest segment of the population in terms of overall percentage of that population, okay? And again, some of the typical historical flows. Back in the 1800s, it was mostly Northern and Western Europeans, followed by Eastern and Southern Europeans, followed by Asian, and Latin American, and that's the case today. So that's just one of those sort of historical artifacts that's sort of left behind, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's where I'm gonna leave it uh, for this week. Again, there's plenty to discuss in terms of, of population. Again, you have the social globalization, human component of geography. You have the physical component of geography. And of course, I highly recommend that you download, or again, that you look at Google Earth using Google Chrome. It's a fantastic tool, not just for um, this course, but also for any other 
aspect of academia you want to uh, take advantage of. I hope you have a fantastic week. Don't forget there's a live study hour each week as needed. If the scheduled one doesn't work for you, one can be set up for you. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic first week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.